to set the scene even more, uh, Sonia, is that even though it was tongue in cheek at that time, uh, we were being told that these were suicide missions. I'm Sonia Morton Firth, and you're tuned in to the Sonia Morton Firth Show. Today, my guest is Des Powell, UK Special Forces veteran and author of the new book, SAS Bravo 30. Watch this interview as Des reveals the story for the first time of what happened to Bravo 30. I believe health is the greatest form of wealth we have, which is why I'm so excited to be partnered with Brother in Arms. Brother in Arms is a wellness brand dedicated to working with veterans, first responders, and anyone on the front line. Through their education, support, and premium CBD products, they help alleviate and restore the lives of those that have been affected by physical and mental trauma. Learn about the life-changing benefits and power of CBD. Join their community today. Hit the link below. Des, it's an honour. It really is an honour to have you here. And uh, we're in Chelsea Harbour. Yeah. Um, and it's a very special day for you today. It certainly is, Sonia. Um, it is my book launch day today. Today um, it is the launch of SES Bravo 30. And it's actually in the bookshops today on the 28th. And we have a book launch tonight at the National Army Museum. So we are going to be uh, having a talk and we are going to be celebrating about the book as well. Now, Des, this is really interesting because the story of Bravo 2-0 is, is well documented. There's been books out, films out. But Bravo 3-0, I, I certainly knew that little about. Um, why is it only now just coming to light? Um, the way to answer that is that, um, it, you were right, you started off about Bravo 2-0, I think. Um, after the Gulf, back in 1991, the first Gulf War, um, everybody remembers about Bravo 20 and Andy McNabb about the book. What most people don't realise is that there were three patrols that was out at that time, Bravo 1, Bravo 2 and the patrol that I was in, Bravo 30. And I have now had permission to write about that this year and um, um, I'm really pleased that I'm being able to bring it out. It's in the bookshelf today. And uh, so, yeah, I'm excited. And now that is 30 years ago, and I'm going to challenge you here, Des. Okay. Can I take you back 30 years? Yes. Can you tell me what happened? Yes. Um, I think just a little bit of a background is that uh, um, Kuwait had been invaded by Iraq. He had a leader at that time, Saddam Hussein. Yeah. Saddam Hussein, the reason he invaded Kuwait is that he had been fighting on his borders with Iran for about eight years, all through the 80s. And he'd virtually bankrupted his country. So we thought, right, the answer to my problems is I invade oil-rich Kuwait. Uh, there was something else he was going to do as well. He was sending out a message to the rest of the world that I am now the big guy on the block. You deal now with Iraq. Uh, I've been fighting with Iran. Um, I have got the biggest or the third largest army in the world at that time, almost a million. And he was telling the world now that Kuwait belongs to me. And because of that, you then saw the largest formation of troops since the Second World War. Mm. Hundreds of thousands of troops formed up in Saudi Arabia, ready to go over the border. So simply the objective was the liberation of Kuwait. So what happened on that day? Because you were there with three patrols, as we've, we've discussed, Bravo 2-0, which has been well documented. But you were part of patrol number three, Bravo 3-0. What happened? Um, what happened at that time is that our commanders were saying that it was possibly, if it went the wrong way, that this was going to be World War Three stuff. And, and, and just to set the scene is that because Saddam had invaded Kuwait, obviously you can't be doing that, mm -hmm. is that the rest of the world had formed up 
then. They called it uh, multinational coalition forces, US-led, hundreds of thousands of troops in Saudi Arabia. And what Saddam was doing very cleverly was firing rockets, missiles, onto neighboring countries, especially Israel. He wanted to bring Israel into the war because he knew that that would cause a larger conflict. And that would have caused thousands and thousands mm. loss of lives. So the game changers were this, is that if um, Israel came into the war, it would have got a larger conflict. And plus, also, the rockets that were being fired, there was a very good chance that there could be chemical warheads because Saddam had used chemical weapons when fighting Iran. So the game changers of causing World War III, and that sounds very dramatic, but I mean, when I... you were there at the time, thousands and thousands of troops forming up, ready for going over the border, you could see how chemical weapons and Israel coming into the war would cause a larger, larger conflict, destabilizing that part of the world. I remember that. I remember being a student at the time and I remember the war being announced and us all sitting in the kitchen watching this tiny little TV back in the day um, and, and, and war being announced um, and the threat of these, mis the, these weapons of mass destruction um, were talked about across the BBC and ITV. Mm. You were a scud mission. Yeah. You were going in behind enemy lines. Um, but as I understand it, you weren't on foot. You were actually in vehicles. Yes. How was that different to, or how did that make the operation different to the, pre, the, the other two units? Well, just to set the scene to answer your question is that because Israel was coming into the war and possibly using chemical weapons, what they said was is that they persuaded Israel to stay out of the war because Israel put a battalion of paratroopers on standby and said, right, they're firing weapons onto Israel. People have been killed because of that. And we are going to parachute into Baghdad and we are going to fight this war. Our government spoke to theirs and said, keep out of the war. We will send the SAS behind enemy lines and we will find these Scud rockets, okay, and stop it because if you come into the war, you know what will happen. And they managed to persuade them not to. So what they come up with was the SAS said, we will have three Bravo patrols. They will go out into the desert, simply find these needles in a haystack, find these missiles, these rockets, send back the information, and that way we can eliminate the targets. So there was, must have been quite a lot of pressure on you and the other units at that time. Were you well briefed? Um, did you have all the necessary uh, equipment, intelligence that you needed to, 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 to have this mission? Uh, no, we had some real problems. And uh, logistics, it was a, a real nightmare. You know, we didn't have the proper weapons, proper ammunition. We didn't have the proper clothing. Our vehicles weren't correct. Um, so, and on top of that, it was the coldest weather that they'd had on record in Iraq. It was sub-zero temperatures. We were told, um, the intelligence said, we will have weather out in the desert. Uh, it will be spring or like spring in the UK. And it turned out to be sub-zero temperatures. In fact, it was that cold that uh, men from my regiment actually died. Wow, and now that's something that you that would be a surprise, I guess, when you think of the desert, you certainly don't think of cold weather, but without the cloud covering. And as I understand it, the weather was a real killer for, for, for the patrols and what happened um, next. Why, why were you not, why didn't you have the weapons that you needed and the intelligence that you needed? It, yes, I mean, you mentioned earlier on about uh, vehicles and, you know, logistic-wise, it, 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 sometimes because of conflict, things happen so fast. For example, when I left uh, in January 91, I was hundreds of miles behind enemy lines within days. So sometimes logistics, equipment, don't meet up with the patrols on the ground fast enough. Um, but yes, there was mistakes that were made that 
they're just mistakes. Didn't bring the proper clothing, didn't bring the proper weapons, or the, the vehicles weren't the proper vehicles, et cetera, et cetera. And, and it's only when you get on the ground that you say, oh, hang on, this is not what we've been told. For example, we were told that it, it was going to be spring weather. We were told that, you know, out in the desert, it's sandy and it's easy to put an OP in. And, well, it wasn't. Once we got on the ground, it was freezing cold. It was very, very rocky. You couldn't dig into the ground. It was like concrete. It was very, very flat. Um, and, and the intelligence told us that we could either do it in vehicles or it could be done on foot. So that's why a couple of the patrols decided to go in on foot. And my patrol, we decided to go in in vehicles. Remember, you can only go on the information, the intelligence that you have at that time. Once you're on the ground and it's different, well, then those are the cars that you've been dealt with. You've got to get on with it. To set the scene even more, Sonia, is that even though it was tongue in cheek at that time, we were being told that these were suicide missions because... What do you mean by suicide well, missions? In, as, as I say, it was tongue in cheek. We're all mm. looking at each other and we heard rumours that, you know, because of the severity of it, I mean, if they're talking... Our commanders are talking Third World War stuff, chemical weapons, Israel coming into the war, oh. all of that part of the world getting... Uh, becoming unstable. Uh, all these countries, uh, you know, as far as... You know, which side are we on and who do we fight for, you know, and it just become very, very confusing. So we knew that this was very important. And we used to joke about, well, no pressure then, we're just going to stop World War Three. And we thought we used to joke about it. Well, our government's talking to the Israeli government saying, um, tell you what, we're going to send three patrols out, SES patrols. We'll sort this. We'll find these rockets in the desert and... And, and don't come into the war, we've got it covered. And we used to laugh about it. We didn't have the right equipment, the right vehicles, the right anything. And, and here we are out in hundreds of miles behind enemy lines, and it's down to us. I mean, it sounds sort of absurd now, thinking about it, going back 30 years, have sent out three patrols, yeah. basically potentially suicide missions, so potentially not coming back. Mm -hmm. And yet you're not given the weapons, you're not given the intelligence. And as I understand, the comms were really bad as well. I mean, how did you feel when you started that mission? When you, how did you feel? Did you think you were coming back alive? Yeah, earlier on when I was kind of joking, I mean, that's what us soldiers do. When we get a bit tense, we look on the funny side of it and um, banter, as we call it in the military. And even though we we're laughing about it, we, we know that this is serious and we know that if there's going to be a larger conflict, it's down to us, it's down to the three patrols. And when we were on the ground and realised that the information that we'd been given wasn't correct and also we didn't have the proper equipment, all of a sudden you said, well, we've got to get on with the job. In hand. At the end of the day, we're soldiers mm. and we've got a job to do and we've been ordered to do it. And we're in the SES. And the nature of our job is, is that historically, we go behind enemy lines, covert mission. No one knows we're there. We get the job done and then come back. Now, I'm going to come on to that because it is also the 80th anniversary of the SAS. Um, and there is a famous motto that I think everyone will know, who dares wins. How did that, the gospel of that, help you through the mission? Yes, is that uh, um, in the book, not giving too much away, uh, I think you might be touching on is that um, I have a, a book, a notebook, and I write sayings down from Churchill, Orwell, and um, they, they inspire, they, they rise, don't you? They, they make you feel uh, good sort of thing, you know. And, yeah, it's like a positive yeah, affirmation. That's right. yeah, 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 that's it. So, um, yeah, it's even though you know your back is a against the wall sort of thing, you go, well, you know, this is the job we do, we've got to get on with it. And and to answer your question even further is that one evening we're behind enemy lines and it was early hours one morning and we sat in the vehicle and all of a sudden we could see flashes in the distance and we realised it was Baghdad getting bombed, getting attacked. And we just sat there quietly and uh, we must have been there for over an hour and nobody said anything. But we could see Baghdad was, was taking some real punishment and we could mm. see flashes and from uh, aircraft coming in and 
we could see Baghdad responding. And we didn't say anything. It was only till the next day that we had a chat and we said, you know, last night we could, we knew that people were being killed. Um, innocent people, not intentionally, mm -hmm. but because of conflict, you get this, you know, and we said, whatever we can do, we've got to do our best we possibly can. You talked about earlier on the other problems were radios. Mm. We couldn't, we had no communications with anyone. So we wasn't sure that the information was, was getting back. Did you know what had happened to Bravo 2-0? Because they were both on foot and obviously they, unfortunately their, their missions had been compromised. Uh, yes, yes. What had happened about that because of the problems with the radios, we were sending blind, hoping that our headquarters were receiving the information. And there was one evening that we got garbled messages back. We were just trying to make sense of it. And we're almost certain that Bravo 2 Zero were on the run, but we couldn't do anything. What a start, we were all working independently. We were all in different areas, even though our, our tasks were, were the same. And because we couldn't communicate by radio, there was nothing we could do. And that was very, very frustrating. We also knew that we had another two squadrons that were fighting independently coming up behind us from the Saudi border over into Iraq and coming up behind us. And we knew that they had had problems as well. And we were almost certain that people had died. And, and that, that was a low point. And plus it started snowing as well in the desert. So there we were. Couldn't communicate. We'd just seen Baghdad getting bombed. Um, we were we were almost certain that Bravo 2 Zero were, was on the run, or we weren't sure that they'd been killed. Mm. And we'd heard that other patrols had been hit as well. And bear in mind, we, we know these guys. So that was a, a, a low point. And then we was even more determined to kind of see it through, no matter what problems we were having. And uh, um, it, it, yes, that was a low point at that time. but. You just got to get on with the job. You've got a task to do, a mission to do. Let's get this done and let's get on. How did you get? Uh, how did you sort of get through that? Was, was the morale presumably was quite low at that point? It, it didn't end just there. To make things even worse is that we started to go down. We exposed ourselves. It, it, it started snowing in the desert. Uh, we didn't have the proper cold weather equipment because of the logistics I talked about earlier on that we wasn't able to marry up at the mm. right time, get the proper equipment. And we, we, we are taught to recognise exposure. One of the things about exposure coming down with severe cold is the obvious thing is you can't feel your hands, your fingers, your toes. But what a lot of people don't realise is that your mind starts to go and you can't make simple decisions, you get irritable, your mind goes foggy and you recognise this and that's very scary because you know that you're going down yourself and if you're going down you know the guys in your patrol are going down as well. So you need to keep that clarity of mind, you've got to be tough, you've got to say you know there's simple things that you can do but you can only do that with a clear mind so we are taught that when we feel ourselves going down with exposure, with cold, is that we must do something about it now. And just simple things like putting on more clothing, the layered method, when you put on clothing, it doesn't have to be thick, you trap air between the layered method, as we call it. Simple things like getting hot drinks down, your hot food. We had a routine out there called hard routine. It means you eat everything cold because we don't want to be compromised by the enemy. And simple things like having shelter from the wind because the wind brings down the temperature even more. So just simple things, getting behind the vehicles. You so know. you were in the vehicles, Land Rovers, as, yes. as I understand. Yes. Were you in the vehicles the whole time? Or? Uh, it, yes, but obviously at night yeah. you sleep out on the ground and you have a system where you have a stagging on system where guys sleep and some guys are on stag, making sure that you don't get compromised and then you take it in turns. But the exposure is, is very, very serious. So what you do, that clarity of mind, you do like a buddy-buddy system is that you watch each other, you talk to each other. In other words, if there's, there's something unusual, the chances mm -hmm. are he's going down with exposure. So doing something early, simple things, you know, that hard routine is that we had to break that because we knew we had to start getting hot drinks down us and hot food. It's not something you would do behind enemy lines normally. 
But now we're realizing that we're not fighting against an enemy, we're fighting against the elements. Now you don't have any control over the weather. Yeah, so we now can't blame logistics for that, can we? So we have to get on with it. So there we are to set the scene behind enemy lines. We'd been out there for a number of days. It was snowing. Uh, we, not the proper equipment, clothing, weapons, radios weren't working properly. But through garbled messages, we now heard that patrols have been hit. Remember, we're hundreds of miles behind enemy lines. We can see in Baghdad in the distance. Mm -hmm. In fact, at one stage, Sonia, we were the furthest, our patrol was the furthest patrol, the furthest coalition force. Only our patrol was the furthest one, hundreds of miles behind enemy lines. And it's that we started laughing and joking to keep our ally. You know, when guys start laughing and joking, you realize that it's, it's to keep, you know, it's that toughness, it's that robustness, that resolve. Let's get on with it. We've got a job to do. And you rally round, you know, it's that unity. We're SES, so, you know, we're there for a reason. And we hear all these things, and even though it was tongue in cheek about suicide missions and Third World War, and, and you know, things are going wrong. Mm -hmm. Things are going wrong drastically. We didn't know that guys had died, we didn't know afterwards but we knew guys was in trouble because we was in trouble and we had vehicles and we knew that if we was having problems and with vehicles, they are definitely having problems because they're on foot. And that made us even more determined because even we didn't know the full situation, we did know that our mission was very, very important. So we had to carry it out the best we could. And that was to find Scud rockets because they were being fired on neighboring countries. So how did you find them? Because you, your mission was successful as yes. I understand it. Yes. So, so talk me through that. Uh, we did a thing which we termed hiding in plain sight, is that because Saddam's forces had all sorts of forces, we were pretending to be Saddam forces. So we'd be driving sometimes through the day and we'd bump into units and civilians in the desert. It becomes quite busy, believe it or not. And we just wave to them. And at night we'd go and hide, you know, and then sometimes in the day we'd bump into people again. We didn't intentionally want to do that, but we said, let's just do our best to blend in. Because we had shemags on, we couldn't see our faces. And because our uniforms were all a mixture and because our vehicles didn't look you know, they looked they unusual. I was about to they say didn't they didn't recognize, recognize the, back no. of the vehicles. And because no one is expecting to have a British force, an SES patrol, hundreds of miles behind enemy lines, just outside Baghdad, no one expected that. So we just called it hiding in plain sight. So how far did you get? We got compromised. We, they knew uh, that we wasn't... Iraqi forces. So at that time, we knew we'd been compromised and we knew we were on the run then because we'd been seen. We knew that troops from the Iraqi army would now be pursuing us. So uh, it had been answered for us now. We had to make a run for the border. Mm -hmm. So what we did, we decided right straight back to Saudi Arabia, the, the border. Um, and what we did was that we started our, our slow route back tactically the best we could, you know, hiding through the day, traveling at night. And, but eventually what happened, we had more problems because one of the vehicles broke down. Oh my gosh, so what did you do? In the vehicle that I was in, we got the chains on the other vehicle and towed it in. And we towed it all the way back to the Saudi Arabia border. And a funny story is, is that just as we come onto the border, we come up to a road, just in the middle of nowhere, a tarmac road, and a junction, like a crossroad yes. junction. And it was very misty, and all of a sudden the mist uh, uh, risen, and we saw an American police car, like a New York cop car. And we thought, this is a bit strange. And we made our very carefully towards the police car, and what it was, it was a Saudi, Saudi Arabian police car. Uh, our police should have said in an American type car, the, the sort of cop car you would see in New York. Yes, yes. And I went towards them, and you can imagine how we looked. Mm. We were armed to the teeth, and we, you know, we'd had 
you know, being out on the ground for about two weeks or so and, you know, we, you know, they weren't sure who we were. So um, we said, look, we're British forces, we've just come back from Iraq. And at first, they, you know, they didn't believe us. Eventually, we persuaded them and said, can you, can you take us to your leader? And uh, we crossed over the border and uh, we managed to get all eight of us back. Okay, I lied. When you got back, how did, did you find out about the other, the other unit? Uh, yes, obviously, you have a debrief. And it was only then that we found that our messages were getting through. We managed to see uh, certain locations that we were almost sure that they were scud mm -hmm. sites or at least enemy positions. Uh, they said yes, we'd uh, that we were successful in in finding those uh, um, those possible scud sites, and uh, um, but then we found out about the Bravo Two Zero mm -hmm. patrol and and what had happened, and we found out that uh, three guys had been killed and the rest had been Too captured, cool, and captured. one had had walked through to Syria. We wasn't to know this until we got back through the garbled messages. We knew. They were having problems, but we didn't know to what extent. And plus, we'd also heard about the other two squadrons that guys had also died in, in those. They'd had contacts and problems as well. Now, Des, you went on um, and did a number of years after that in the SAS. How many years did you serve? I did over 19 years in the 19 SAS. 19 years. And if you look back at your time, because I'm sure that you've got a, quite a fair few stories there. Can you look back at that mission and think, well these are the learning points I'd take from that or you took from that? Yeah, I suppose uh, not to take things for granted. You know, you, um, for example, look at the weather. We were told that it was going to be uh, uh, spring in UK and it turned out to be the coldest weather on record. So, no, we have no say over the weather. Mm. Um, but logistic-wise, yeah, we did have problems. I suppose, yeah, is, is don't take things for granted. And um, plus you realise as well is that uh, life is very fickle, especially in the, um, uh, the, the sort of life that I've, I've, I've led. We have a saying up at the regiment, um, which goes something like this. Um, in the business that we do, it's very easy to become dead. It's staying alive that's the hard part. I love that, Des. I feel like that's almost a moment... Just before we finish, though, as you say, the book launch is today. What are you, you hoping your readers get from this book? Uh, I think it's a good book. I think there's something in this book for everybody. It doesn't only just talk about the mission. It talks about other missions that I've been on as well. It talks about my life in the regiments and about other things that I've done in life as well. So it's like a life story and the missions that I've done and... I think there's something for everybody in there. I think people will, will really enjoy it. Des, I feel like there's a part two here because we've concentrated very much on, on the Gulf War, but you must have some stories to tell. But I just want to say thank you so much. Um, I, I've, I've learned so much, and I think a lot of people out there will learn a lot from, from your book. Is there anything else that you would like to say on that point? Um, Sonia, just thank you very, very much for having me today. I've really enjoyed it. Great. Des, thank you so much. Thank you. Hope you enjoyed the show. Remember, there's a new interview out every Monday. So hit subscribe and like, and you'll get it straight into your inbox.